Welcome to our broadcast tonight. It is Tuesday night Bible study. Um, I wanted to pick up with some things that I was actually studying over the weekend um, <clears throat> about the Torah portion this week. Um, it's, as usual, the Torah portion is so big and it encompasses so much in it that you really could spend an entire year just on that one portion. Um, <clears throat> but this week, we've stepped into the book of Exodus in the Torah portions. And the book of Exodus in Hebrew is called Shemot, which is names. So it's interesting that the entire um, saga of the Jewish uh, exodus from Egypt is called names. What is it that's so significant about names that Yahweh chooses to, to name an entire book in the Bible that? Um, <clears throat> so let's turn over to Exodus chapter 1 to start. Exodus chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> These are the names of the sons of Israel who came into Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all the offspring of Jacob who were 70 persons. Jo Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all of his brothers and all that generation. But the descendants of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, and the land was full of them. <clears throat> now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the Israelites are too many and too mighty for us, and they outnumber us both in people and in strength. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply more and should war befall us. They join our enemies, fight against us, and escape out of the land. So they set over the Israelites taskmasters to afflict and oppress them with increased burdens. And the Israelites built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more they multiplied and expanded, so that the Egyptians were vexed and alarmed because of the Israelites. And the Egyptians reduced the, slave, the Israelites to severe slavery. We're going to stop there for a moment. It's interesting to note that the very thing that the enemy is afraid of, them increasing, them growing mighty, they're going to put on them a heavier burden. They're going to oppress them. They're going to come down on them. And that causes them to grow even more. So it's like no matter what it comes against the people of God, you can't squash them out. You can't, you can't get them to go away. And we're going to see that as we move on. But <clears throat> to pick up with what it starts out in the, in the first verse about the names of the sons of Israel. Why doesn't it just say these are the sons of Israel? It says these specifically are the names of the sons of Israel. And names we know have significance. They have power. We've talked about that a lot in this congregation. They define us. They are our identity. Names are, are kind of in, you, not kind of, they are inseparable from our identity. They define us of who we are. Um, they, they represent our identity not because they're a convenient way to allow us to be distinguished from one another, but they define us, the essence of who we are. The names we're given at birth are not accidental. You know, and even if your parents didn't know what you were named, as a matter of fact, if you have a name that you might not want the, the meaning of it, maybe consider changing your name because of how significant names are. <clears throat> Talking about if you have like a name like Adolf or something, you know, <laughs> that has a negative connotation. Um, but they capture our essence and our keys to our very spiritual life. Um, they're more than a bunch of letters that are just grouped together to sound pleasant to the ear. Names are more than a convenience, allowing people to talk to each other. They are a gift from God. The words contain his power. And, you know, you start looking up the significance of your name, the significance of, of what's, what's inside of that name. There's a lot of power to that. Names are a book. They tell a story. They tell a story of our spiritual potential as well as our life's mission. You go and look up each of the names of the children of Israel, the sons of Israel, they had significance to their names. Their mothers, when they were naming them, had named them because of either situations that were going on in their lives or because of something that they had a vision from, from the Lord as to what this child is going to be. And that, that name in it 
carried the potential for those children to live up to that. And there's always two sides to it. You know, you look at, we were talking about this a couple weeks ago, but Jacob, Jacob's name could mean supplanter and deceiver, and he started living down that road. But it can also mean the one who overcomes and treads the enemies under his feet. You know, so you can fall on either side. And, and if you're not aware of what you're calling, you know, we, t we know about faith, calling things that be not as though they are. And if you're not aware of what you're calling yourself by your name, then the enemy will always try to make it fall on the negative. You know, so, so if your name, if your name, like for my, for my name, for instance, Jordan, means that which flows down. Well, there can be a positive flowing down and there can be a negative flowing down. It's your choice. Rebecca means the one who is bound. Well, that could be a positive binding, like I'm cleaving to the Lord, or it can be you're bound in captivity. There's two sides to it. Um, <clears throat> but they, they bring us meaning, and they, there's a midrash. You know, when we talk about the sages, they have midrashes that tells us that when we complete our years on this earth and face heavenly judgment, the most, one of the most powerful questions we will be asked is, what is your name, and did you live up to it? which is an interesting thing to think of. You know, we talk about being the best version of you that you possibly can be, and you're going to be measured up against what Yahweh called you to be, not what this other person is, not what your parents thought you would be, not what you dreamed you would be. You're going to be measured up against what Yahweh called you to be in the end. Who was the first one to ever call something or someone by name? It was Yahweh. Yahweh. He... <clears throat> He used names not just for the sense, sake of identification, but he used it for creation. Genesis 1.1, he starts in the beginning. He created the heavens and the earth. Was the first thing he spoke, light be, and there was light. He named light. He literally gave a name to that and called it into existence. He merely gave it a name, and the very letters defined its atomic structure. Think of it. He gave it the name, and the very letters defined its atomic structure. He named it into existence. And that kind of makes your, your head go tilts in some ways. But, and then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water, and there it was. He called it sky. So he's naming these things and it's creating their very structure, their atoms that they're made up of. Everything is wrapped up in what he names it. From he made the dry ground and he called it land, and from that land he made Adam. What did he call, what he called, he made man, he called him Adam from the ground in Hebrew. So it's, it's literally everything connected together. But then he gave Adam the power to name things. That was his first task, go and name the creatures. Um, names are responsible for the differences between everything on the earth. Think of it, hot, cold. Well, it's the very name of it itself that distinguishes one from the other. Um, when uh, names came before the existence of those things which they would subsequently be identified. So the name came first, then the thing was attached to it. And, and that's how it came into power. Um, names are not the offspring, but rather the parents of everything in the universe. The things really are what they are called. You ever hear the whole thing Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet? Well, that's not entirely true. I, mean, I think of I, Anna Green Gables talks about that, that. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, I don't think a rose would smell as sweet if it's called a skunk cabbage. Like there's something about the name creates a different picture in your mind. And even, even with when we're thinking of things that just in this natural realm, you have a certain sense, a certain connotation that is attached to the name of something, that if you try to name it something else, it, your mind won't accept it. It's like, well, that's not true. That's, that can't be what that is, because I know what that is. Um, when Abraham, Abram, and he wasn't Abraham yet, when he came to the realization that Yahweh was the one and only God, his name had to be changed. He came to that moment, 
in Genesis 17, 5, neither, no, neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For the father of a multitude have I made you. So he named him the father of a multitude. Then he became the father of a multitude. So what you name it, it will become. The change of identity required a change of identification. So if you want to change an identity, you have to change how you're identifying yourself. Uh, Jacob, whose name came from the root word meaning heal, which so perfectly suited someone whose approach to the problems of life was always to flee. He didn't think of it. He was always running away from the problems. Suddenly he realized he had to fight rather than to flee when he encountered that angel. Um, the angel tells him, you will no more be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel, for you have strived with God and man and have prevailed. So at that moment, Jacob's life changed. Now you're Israel, now you are named a different thing. A traumatic lifestyle change brings with it a new personal descriptive. So traumatic can be positive or negative. It's a, a drastic change in your life. You know, the, the, there's a custom if somebody's like severely ill in Judaism, they'll change their name to something that means healing, like something that has Raphael in it, you know. So I'm going to name myself the healed. Well, isn't that what, what, what the Bible is all about? You know, your faith made you whole. Call, you haul the things that be not as though they are, and then it, they come into existence. Um, when the children of Israel were redeemed from Egypt, um, the Midrash says it was in the merit of three things that the Almighty took note of their suffering. And further on in this Torah portion, it actually says that, that he, he heard their cries. They came before his ears. We'll get into that in a little bit. But it says because of three things, they may have been imperfect in many ways, but overriding their sins was the fact that they did not change their names, they did not change their language, and they did not change their mode of dress. That's how they identify themselves. You know, you look at Joseph, when he went down into Egypt, he got a new name that was an Egyptian name. His children grew up in the Egyptian way. Even Moses himself, you see, you see later on in this portion, Moses comes and he has that encounter where he goes and kills the Egyptian and all that. And then he flees out into the desert. He ends up coming and in, in meeting up with, um, uh, what's her name? Zipporah and, and her father, and he meets, meets them and all that, and they say, this Egyptian came to see us. Well, he was so, he had been raised in the, in the Pharaoh's palace as a prince of Egypt, so he was so identified by his dress, by how he talked, everything, he looked like an Egyptian. He walked like an Egyptian. But now, suddenly, Moses comes to this point in his life where he's like, no longer am I identifying as that. I'm choosing, and it actually says in Psalms, he chose rather to identify with the people of God. And there's that point in all of our lives where we have to choose what we're going to identify as, what we're going to choose to identify with. Um, it's a custom to name children after people who you deeply admire or seek to memorialize in Judaism. Uh, to link a newborn with someone from the past is to bring together two spirits in an inseparable bond of life. That's why it's so important when you're naming children when they're born. You know, you, you got to look into the meaning of the name. You got to look into even people that are connected to that name. Indeed, the Bible says in uh, 1 Samuel 25, 25, as his name is, so is he. And that was talking about the Naboth. And he was a fool. His name meant fool, and he acted a fool. Well, why, why his mother named him a fool, I don't know. There's <laughs> some names in the Bible I look at it and I'm like, I would never name my child that. But as his name was, that's how he lived his life. Um, Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches, and to be esteemed is better than silver and gold. So if you have a name that carries with it the destiny that you're called to live out, then that's something to be desired. Uh, does that mean that we're predestined to live our lives directed or, or circumscribed by something that's beyond our, our, you know, our goal, our reach? It's not beyond our, our control? Like, okay, well, I was named this, so that's how I'm going to be. No. We have a freedom of 
choice. We have free wills. God has given us that. But our names are indicators of our potential, and they can be predictors of our possible futures. It depends on how you fall in that. We will forever leave behind our names as a final legacy. You know, think of it, how many people you think of, like even George Washington. His name is synonymous with the father of our country. It's synonymous with everything that you think of when you think of George Washington, the great leader he was, the man of God that he was. He left that behind as his legacy. And our names will outlive us. So we need to do everything possible to make them be remembered for a blessing. You know, it's like um, it's the people in the Bible who are remembered. They're written in there for, for all the ages. Some of them for good, some for bad. I think Judas Iscariot. He was remembered all right, but not in a way that we ever want to be remembered. But <clears throat> there's a three-word question that most of us spend our lives trying to answer, trying to find, find the answer to. And even if we don't necessarily consciously realize that we're trying to answer this question, but the question is, who are you? Who are you? Who am I? And I think all of us have asked ourselves that at one point. Who am I? What, what is my purpose? When it comes to mind, what comes to mind when you hear those three words? Who are you? How do you answer that question? How do you personally answer that question of who you are? It's a question that cuts to the core of identity. Who are you at the core of your being? Not just who are you on the surface. It reveals what you believe about yourself, how you answer that. It reveals what you value and where you find your significance. Some people answer that with their vocation, their job title. You know, I'm a house cleaner, I'm a this, I'm a that. Well, is that the essence of who you are? Is that the core of who you are? I'm a stay-at-home mom. Is that the core of who you are, or are you more than that? It's common to tie our identity to work, but what happens if your job changes or the company dissolves? So many people, I mean, it's, it's true, especially in the corporate world, so many people go through these crises when, when their company dissolves or their title changes, and they really don't know what to do with it because they had so formed their identity by their job. It's a, not a solid place to form your identity. Uh, some people place their identity in their family roles, husband, wife, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, friend, whatever you're, you're identifying with relationships. But many people have found that relationships are not the stablest place to place your identity either. Sometimes we tie our identity to our behavior whether that's positive or negative. Think of people who, who identify, I'm an addict, or I'm, I'm divorced, or I'm this. I'm a leader. Either one, positive or negative, is that the core of who you really are. Their identity statements. When we let our successes or our sins define us, it can become more difficult to embrace the identity that Yahweh has for us. So if you're letting things in the natural around you even your own personality define you, then you're not going to really be able to open up and embrace what Yahweh has for you. What is the potential he has for you? <clears throat> Adam named all the animals. He named Eve. And that power has been given to us to name. Um, Ephesians 5.8 says, For once you were darkness, now you are light. So he's literally called us, he's named us the same Yahweh that named the, the light that forms the universe, named us as light. And he says to live as children of light. Once he gave you your new name, you're a new creation in him. The old has passed away, literally. You're not that identity anymore. You know, I like uh, this uh, uh, whoever saw the latest Chosen episode, there's this one scene in it where they're coming to a point where they realize that this person has so changed their life that they're not, they're not the same person anymore. And he said, I can literally go back and say, this person is dead. It's true. They're dead. They, that's not who they are anymore. So you can literally say that, that, that old person there, that person who was whatever it was defined by, is dead. 
Now the new has come, and now you literally have been reborn into a new identity. Um, and it's time to start looking through the word and helping, having the word help us to understand what our true identity is. If we find our identity in this word, this is the one thing that will not fail. You know, it says, though heaven and earth pass away, my words will not pass away. This is the one thing that's solid. It's the one foundation that's solid when everything else is shaking. And that's the one thing that we can found our lives upon. Uh, you know, it's interesting. There's a story I, re I saw here. And it was from Indonesia, the country of Indonesia. And it highlights the significance of a name. This woman, Yudea, is a 21-year-old mother with two children. She didn't know the importance of having a healthy environment. She didn't know the benefit of boiling water before drinking it, washing hands before touching meals. She hadn't learned any of that. Never asked her children to take a bath, never asked them to wash their hands and feet after they played. Didn't know that if someone didn't clean up their body, they can get sick easily. And so when she had her first daughter, she couldn't buy milk, couldn't buy vitamins, couldn't buy anything to help her, didn't know any of the hygiene stuff. So her daughter always got sick very easily. And then she ended up coming into contact with this um, Christian program where she was able to receive support and they started teaching her just basic hygiene and you know the vitamins you need to take and stuff like that. And she became pregnant again with her, with her second child. And when she gave birth to her second child, it was a healthy son, and she named him a word in Indonesian called Sisipi, which means grateful to God because she was so grateful that God had helped her with her children and, and she wanted to name him something that returned her gratefulness to God. Well, it's interesting because this child does not get sick easily like the other children in the neighborhood. As he plays with friends his age, he looks different. He's more active than the other children. When all the other children don't have extra energy to run around, he can run around everywhere without feeling tired at all. He's a fast learner, loves to ask his mother questions, and she relates that to his name. He was named something that meant I'm returning gratefulness to God and because of that his entire his entire life has changed. His entire life is different. Names contain meaning for people. They define people as to who they are. Why is it that you look at the negative side of it? You look at what happened back during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. What was the, one of the first things that when the camps started coming up across Europe, what was the first thing that they started doing to the Jewish people, to the prisoners? They took their name away and replaced it with a number. And now you're no longer, no longer um, Goldstein, you know, you're not, no longer Moshe Goldstein. Now you're number 34265. And that's how you're identified. So you're pre prisoner 34265, and you're called that day after day after day. And for some of these people who are in the camps, they're in the camps for a year, two years, if they survived. But what does that do to a person if you take their name away? You take away their name, you take away their identity, you take away everything from them, and now you're just a name? What does that do emotionally? What does that do psychologically? What does that do inside of a person? Um, it's interesting because it was one of the Nazis' key strategies for annihilating the identities of their victims. It's a key strategy. And I might add, it's going on right now in North Korea. North Korea has concentration camps that they're locking up Christian prisoners in. And there was a story I recently saw about a young woman who's being held in detainment in the, as a political prisoner, or whatever they call it, to have her, you know, be re retaught so that she can, whatever. But she had managed to get her story out, somehow smuggled her story out of there. And she talked about how, how hard it was even being a believer. She said she put her faith in the Lord and that's where she found her strength. But even then, having her name stripped away, that was the thing that they did the first. They gave her a number, stripped her name away, stripped away anything, any contact with the outside world, start stripping those things away and you reduce a person to nothing. And if there's nothing for them to hold on to, then why, why are they even alive anymore? Um, number tags issued in the Mathausen concentration camp are remembered by survivors as materializations of their destroyed identities. And bureaucratic means in the murderous camp economy. 
But several preserved tags, now this is interesting, because in the midst of all the atrocities that were going on, they had these number tags. Some of these preserved tags carried prisoner-made decorations on them. And it was a point toward their personalization strategies. Like, I don't care if you're, you're calling me a number, I'm going to make it as personalized as I can. You might say I have to be called this number in this camp, but I'm going to put some sort of identity on it that sets me apart from the rest. There's just something inherent in human nature that as much as uh, people try to blend in with the crowd, there's also that side of us that's like, I am a, I am a, uh, I am a different individual than everybody else. Each one of us, you know, even our fing fingerprints are different. There's nothing that causes, it's, there's no clones where you are exactly like this person here. We each have our own individual identities. That's what the, the enemy tries to steal. That's what communism tries to steal. That's what Nazis tried to steal, is individuality and identity. And if they can sh strip that away, then they have a, they have robots, basically. It's just listen to what they say. But the fact that these, these tags came out and they were personalized showed that there are some people that still were fighting to hold on to what they were being stripped away. In Auschwitz, nobody knew names. Nobody knew, nobody knew names. The German officer, when he was talking to you, he was talking to a number. Didn't know your name, didn't know anything about you. You were a number to him. And think of it, even if you look at how their personal appearances were. They'd shave all their heads, put the same uniform on, so one person looked like the next. There was no distinguishing, nothing to distinguish this person from this person. Um, this is an interesting uh, article I had found about this Italian Jew named Primo Levi who had survived Auschwitz. He came through the Holocaust, survived Auschwitz. He was a scientist, and he went on to write powerful poems and memoirs about his experiences in the camp. In the following passage, he describes his first days as a prisoner in Auschwitz. In a moment, with almost prophetic intuition, the reality was revealed to us. We had reached the bottom. It was not possible to sink lower than this. No human condition was more miserable than this, nor could it be conceivably so. Nothing belongs to us anymore. They have taken away our clothes, our shoes, even our hair. If we speak, they would not listen to us, and if they listen, they will not understand. They will even take away our name. And if we want to keep it, we'll have to find in ourselves the strength to do so. You know, if you want to hold on to your name, that was a fight back then. To somehow manage, uh, to manage somehow so that behind the na name, something of us, of us as we were, still remains. We know that we will have difficulty in being understood, and this is as it should be, but consider what value, what meaning is enclosed even in the smallest of our daily habits. In the hundred possessions which even the poorest beggar owns, a handkerchief, an old letter, the photo of a cherished person, these things are part of us, almost like limbs of our body. Nor is it conceivable that we can be deprived of them in our world, for we immediately find others to substitute for the old ones. Even like, you always have something in your life that you're replacing. If you get rid of something, you replace it with something else. Other objects which are ours in their personification and evocation of our memories. Imagine now a man who is deprived of everyone he loves, and at the same time of his house, his habits, his clothes, in short, everything he possesses. He'll be a hollow man, reduced to suffering and needs, forgetful of dignity and restraint, for he who loses all often easily loses himself. He will be a man whose life or death can be lightly decided with no sense of human affinity. In the most fortunate of cases, on the basis of pure judgment of utility. And it is in this way that one can understand the double sense of the term extermination camp. And now it is clear that we seek to express with the phrase to lie on the bottom. This man, I mean, he found a powerful way to express what was going on in there. Um, Haftling, prisoner. I have to learn that I'm Haftling. My number is 174517. We have been baptized. We will carry the tattoo on our left arm until we die. Um, 
all in a row, they place us all in a row and one by one according to alphabetical order of our names we file past a skillful official armed with a sh sort of pointed tool with a very short needle. It seemed that this is the real true initiation. Only by showing one's number can one get bread and soup. Several days passed and not a few cuffs and punches before we became used to showing our number promptly enough not to disorder the daily operation of food distribution. Weeks and months were needed to learn its sound in the German language. And for many days, while the habits of freedom still led me to look for the time on my wristwatch, my new name ironically appeared instead, a number tattooed in bluish characters under the sin, skin. By taking away their identity, they either control people better or the people simply lose their will to live and die. That's what happened in those camps. You know, a lot of the people who, who died in the camps, it wasn't because of the physical torture. It was because of removing their entire identity, removing their names. What else do I have to live for? Taking away my family, everything I own, I have nothing to live for anymore. Uh, remove their identity, take their will, take their will to live, and their will to fight back. And this is called psychogenic death. So what is your name? And why is it important? You know, we can see it in, in a case like that of how negatively it impacts somebody by stripping their name away. Think of, think of the whole thing, and, and Dad used to talk about this, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Think of the, the names that cruel children would call each other in, in school. And those names, a lot of times, they stuck. They hurt. Even if, even if it, it became something that was familiar to you, it was something that hurt. It was something that carried a wound with it. So either attaching a name or removing the name, like I'm going to call or think of parents who call their children stupid. You're stupid. How does that name affect that child? How does attaching that label to that child affect them? Our names are powerful. Words are powerful. And when you, when you come to the point of, of your name, the biggest thing, just like the Nazis had that, just like the, the regime in North, North um, Korea takes away the names, the enemy is always out trying to take your name. Because what name have you been named by? You've been named by the name of Yeshua. He's now the name that you've been named by. So if he can strip your name, strip your identity, you don't know who you are, you're helpless against him. You're either going to submit to him, just give up, I'm not going to fight against him. That's where he wants you. Think of, think of uh, in Chosen when, when uh, there's those powerful scenes where, where they're coming to the demoniacs and, and there, there's that interchange between Mary and the demoniac that was coming in and she was saying to him, what is your name? And he was trying to say his name, but because of the demon inside of him that was overriding him, that was trying to just say it, but Yeshua comes, casts the demon out, and is like, what is your name? Like, your name is something that's your identi identity. And the enemy always tries to rename people. He really does. It's not, not uncommon. He tries to rename them. If not physically, then emotionally, spiritually, whatever the, is going on inside of you. What do you call yourself when you're alone at night? What, is, go, what do you call yourself in the depths of your mind? Are you constantly telling yourself you're stupid? Because what you call yourself is even more powerful than what somebody else calls you. Um, and when, when Yeshua comes and reaches Mary, he uses that powerful verse from Isaiah. You know, I've called you by name, you are mine. This, uh, that is like one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. It's like I'm not just calling me, hey, you, I want you. No, I'm calling you by name, you are mine. It's a sense of identity. He's reaching into the midst of the darkness and giving you a name and saying, I know you. I know where you've been. I know what's going on in your life, and I'm here with you. You're mine. And, and it's just so, I don't know, I even know how to describe how powerful that is. But when, while naming is tied to authority in scriptures, you name something that gives you the sense of authority, it also reveals intimacy. Naming happens in a context of relationships. You know, a mother naming her child, and even Yahweh naming, naming man. It's a sense of a relationship. 
In Genesis 16, 14, when Hagar was wandering in the wilderness and she's, she's searching for, for water and all this, is, she's near death, Yahweh comes and rescues her and she gives him a name as the one who sees me. And there's an intimacy in that that it's like, I, now she's naming Yahweh out of the relationship that you're the one who rescued me and you rescued me because you see me. It's like you see me, you know where I am, you know what I've been doing, you know what's going on in my life. The creator of the universe and he knows that. In Revelation 3.12 it says, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God and they will be citizens in the city of my God the new Jerusalem, and I will also write on them my new name. So he's identifying us as being his again. Um, Isaiah 49, 14 through 16, yet Jerusalem says, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. You know, I think there's a lot of people who in their life can get to a point where they feel forgotten, whether it be by people, whether it be by people who you thought should not forget about you. And you can feel forgotten, feel alone. And that's where Jerusalem had gotten to that point where the Lord's deserted us. The Lord's forgotten us. We don't know where, what's going on here. But Yahweh's answer is never, never. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that was possible, I would not forget you. See? I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Yahweh writes his name on the palms of his hands. That's how much he takes, takes uh, seriously. That's how much value he puts in your name, that he wrote it on the palm of his hands. When you name someone, it shows that there's an intimate knowledge, a relationship, and a privilege. And then we get to the second part of this Torah portion. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And this is where Moses is keeping the flock in the, in the desert of Sinai. Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, a bush burned with fire yet was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. So he called him by name. Again, he wasn't, hey, you, come here. He called him by name. And he said, here am I. God said, do not come near. Put your shoes off your feet for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Also, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So he's immediately identifying who he is. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters and oppressors, for I know their sorrows and sufferings and trials. And I've come down to deliver them out of the hand and power of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a land good and large, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the Israelites has come to me, and I've also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So he's saying, I'm hearing them, I'm seeing them. He's identifying himself with the people. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring me Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will surely be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? See, see the significance of that? What is his name? What shall I say to them? So Moses is coming to this point where he's saying, I, I want to know what, uh, what should I tell them if they ask, ask me what your name is. And so what does God say? Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God said also to Moses, this you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and by this name I am to be remembered to all generations. So you see the connection between that and the beginning of the book? He starts out, these are the names of the sons of Israel. Now he's saying, now here's my name. There's something significant in this Torah portion about names. And so when he, when he comes to this place, does, Yahweh, does, does God want us to know him intimately? Does he want us to know him by name? Well, yeah, he says right there that this is the name for my name forever and ever, and this is the name I am to be remembered to all generations. He wants this name to be remembered. Um, it also says in Joel 2, verse 31 to 32, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How can you call upon his name unless you know his name? You can't call upon the name of someone, you can't call someone that you don't know their name. So he's, his name is pretty important to him. Interesting how his name has been lost in translation throughout the years. And, and even to this day, the, the sages the, and the rabbis will say, you can never pronounce that name. Well, this is the name he said to call me. Like, he's like, I told you to call me this name, and this is the one name you're not going to call me. But what he said in Hebrew was, Ehye asher ehye, which literally, what's lost in translation is it's Yahweh, is where we get that word Yahweh, yud he vav he from that. But what's lost in translation is the relationship between God's self-identification as I am and Yahweh. What's, what's the significance of that? Hebrew verbs utilize prefixes to indicate a change in person. So I versus you versus he, she, it, they use, they use prefixes to identify that, among other things. The verbal, remo- root, bleh, the verbal root remains the same as the prefix changes to indicate the person and the number. So I am and Yahweh utilize the same verbal root with a change in prefix. Instead of I am, Yahweh would be rendered he is. So he's saying I am, but now we're calling him Yahweh, which means he is. But what does that mean? It means he's ever beyond anything we can ask, think, or imagine. The fact that it begins, Ehyeh, Asher, Ehyeh, begins with Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is indicative of the future tense, which the Amplified picks up on it. I will be what I will be. This should give us confidence, encourage us, since we can understand that God is not only with us right now, but he goes ahead of us into our future. He's already walked that path before us. And it might be unknown to us, but it's completely known to him. Nothing catches him off guard. He's already there. He's been there. He's done it. And he knows what to do. He's faithful and will be whatever we need, not only now, but also in any circumstance that that we face. He's saying, I will be whatever you need me to be in that circumstance. Healer, deliverer, provider, protector, I will be that for you. So his very name means I'm going to be whatever you need me to be for you. I mean, it's so powerful. Even in his own name is a sense of relationship. It's not just this creator God that's standing up in the sky somewhere and separate from his creation. It's I'm going to be whatever you need me to be for you in that moment. In essence, this name conveys a sense of both the timeliness and the timelessness of Yahweh. So he's, he, he's absolutely on time when you need him. And he's also out of time. (laughs) He's completely out of our range of time. He's the one who was, who is, and is to come, it says in Revelation. So he reveals his name to us so that we can call upon his name. Think of, uh, it says that in Psalm 91, you call upon my name, I will answer you. Um, God says also that his name Yahweh is his memorial. This is to be my memorial. It's supposed to be a remembrance from generation to generation. This is how he's going to be remembered. Um, it's, it, you can't separate his name from his reputation. 
can't separate his name from his identity. This is how he's choosing to identify himself. It's his very being. And in his name, you're taught his character. You're taught attributes of, of Yahweh. You're taught what makes Yahweh, Yahweh, <laughs> quite literally. Apart, what sets him apart from anyone else? What makes him distinct? What makes him holy? What makes him different than anything else? separate from all others, and what he does for you and what he does for everyone, all wrapped up in that name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. How can a name be a strong tower? Only Yahweh's name. Only Yahweh's name. So what happened when the church rewrote Yeshua's name and identity? Let's take, I mean, you just don't do that. <laughs> like, really, think of it. Like, you, 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 you meet Jose down there, you don't change his name to John, you know? It's, that's his name. Like, you, just because you don't speak the language doesn't mean you have the right to change somebody's name. You know, so they take Yeshua, well, we want to make it Greek, so we're going to change it into Jesus. Now he's called Jesus. Well, that was never his name. Never, never heard Jesus anywhere in his lifetime. But what happened when the church changed Yeshua to Jesus, they also changed Yahweh, Adonai, El Shaddai. They changed it to God. And now we have Jesus and we have God. And those are very intellectual things. There's no sense of the character of who they are. There's no sense of their attributes. There's no sense of identification. There's no sense of relationship in that. You can just say, oh, I believe in God. And there's no connection to it at all. It says even the demons believe in God, but they don't, they don't have a relationship with him. But when we change that, we lost the true identity, and not only do we lose the identity in who they are, we lose our identity as the church because our identity is intertwined with his. So if we lose Yeshua's identity for who he was, we come back to what Dad was always talking about. The church has gone away from its roots. It's lost the identity because it lost the name. That's how important a name is. But we need to start searching through the word to see how he identifies himself. But then we need to see how he identifies us. That's who we really are. We serve a God who renames people. Just look at how many times he did it throughout the word. He did it to think of when he, he meets Peter, this headstrong fisherman here. He renames him. He renames him on this rock and says, I'll, I, he name, renames him Rock, and then he says, on the rock of the revelation, I'm going to build my church. But he's naming him something that gives him a sense of stability in his life. Peter had anything but stability in his life before that. Okay? And he still, he still had some traits that he had to overcome, even throughout his experience with Yeshua. But his name gave him something of a destiny to hold on to. And he started to change to come into alignment with that because he realized that. Yahweh has a way of marking us and tearing down our own concocted identities. How many times have we been stripped of something that we thought, oh, that's who, that's who I am, that's who I really want to, that's what I really have always wanted to do all my life, and you find out you're actually doing the opposite, and you have to like go through a humbling process of being stripped of what you thought you were. Um, <clears throat> he doesn't do it because he doesn't value uniqueness. Nor does he do it because he wants us all to look the same. He's not like that. The scriptures declare that he was an active participant in our creation. Psalm 139 talks about that. You wove me together. You knit me together, almost like embroidering various colors in my mother's womb. It's not just a cookie cutter. I'm cutting you out of, a, uh, out of the same material that I cut everybody else out of, and here you are. No, he made you. He, his hands fashioned you. Um, Yahweh values uniqueness. He created it. The reason he strips us of our own identities is because he offers us a greater identity. He has a greater identity than we could ever imagine. <clears throat> Consider these phrases that are directly from Scripture. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's your identity. Seen. Known. Loved, child of God, predestined, adopted, not forgotten, no longer orphans, 
filled with the Spirit, full of the Messiah, united with the Messiah, one Spirit with Yahweh, chosen, accepted, forgiven, not forsaken. This is who he identifies you as. Reconciled, free from condemnation, a new creation, complete in the Messiah, holy, blameless, without a single fault. That one will make your mind go tilt. <laughs> but think of it. Paul. Paul stood up and said to, to the Christians, he says, I have wronged no man. You look at that in the natural and you say, okay, Paul, I thought you were the one who stood by when they were stoning Stephen, and you were the one who was, who was the foremost persecutor of the church. How can you say, I have wronged no man? Because that man's dead. That man was dead back on the road to Damascus. This is not, I'm not who I was then. It's quite literally a new creation. Uh, no longer slaves, free, heirs, secure, transformed, renewed, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, salt, light, not your own, bought with a price, created in the image of God, baptized into the Messiah, honored, raised with the Messiah, dead to sin, alive to God, part of the body, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, the bride of the Messiah, renamed. That's who he calls you. The enemy will always try to rename you, try to label you, try to say you're forgotten. You're just a number in the vastness of humanity. But our Yahweh is the God of Psalm 147. Let's turn over there in conclusion. <clears throat> Psalm 147, verse 4. He determines and counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. If he calls the stars by their names, why wouldn't he call us by name? If he can keep track of the billions of stars that are out there in the universe and has a name for each and every one, but then he comes down and he says that even the very hairs on our head are numbered. We don't even keep track of how many hairs are. I don't know how many hairs are on my head. He numbers them all. He knows not just your name, but he knows how many hairs are on your head. I mean, the creator of everything, just, just, just wrap your mind around that. Actually, wrap your heart around that. Your mind won't comprehend it. But the same God who says, you know, I, I, he determines and count, counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. You back up and he says that he heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds, curing their pains and sorrows. In verse 6, he lifts up the humble and downtrodden. In verse 11, he says he takes pleasure in those who reverently and worshipfully fear him. So he's a personal creator. He's not just, like I said, he's not just a creator that's up in the sky somewhere. He has relationship with his people. In Revelation, it says twice that the believers' names are not only written in the book of life, but they have been written there since before the foundation of the world. I mean, if anybody tries to tell you that you're not worthy, anybody tries to tell you you're not enough, anybody tries to tell you, remind you of your past, let me tell you, from the foundation of the world, I'd say that's pretty past. My name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm just going to finish up by reading a few scriptures to you. You can write these down after. Isaiah 43, verse 1, But now thus says the Lord, who, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Jeremiah 1, verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. John 10, verse 3, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, 
and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. John 10, 14 through 15, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Psalm 191, verse 14, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. If we know his name, that's our connection, our personal, personal relationship with Yahweh. We know his name. We know him as a father, and he's protecting us. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and I made. He's formed and he made each and every one of us. Exodus 33, 17 and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And to hear that Yahweh knows you by name, it's like that's even better than like the president knowing you by name. Like it's uh, the greatest one ever knows you by name. Isaiah 40, uh, 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Revelation 3.5, The one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He's speaking our name. Yeshua's speaking our name out there. Isaiah 49, 16, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Matthew 10, 30, But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Isaiah 44, 21, Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. You're not forgotten by him. I'm not forgotten. He knows my name. Joseph may have thought he was forgotten, but Yahweh knew his name. David may have thought he was forgotten out there and taking care of the sheep, but Yahweh knew his name, and he called him a man after his own heart. Moses may have thought he was forgotten, hiding in the back side of the desert, but Yahweh knew his name. Let me tell you something. He's coming for us, and he knows us by name. We're not forgotten by him. He is coming soon, and he knows our name. Names are significant to Yahweh. We need to know, not only know his name, but we need to know who we are in him, what he calls us, what he's created us to be. And find our true identity in this, not in anything around us, not in our jobs, not in any, anything that anybody else has told us, but only in him is our true identity. And when we find that, we're going to find out just the plans that he has for us, plans to prosper us, not to harm us, plans for a future for us. And he has that for each and every one of us. He hasn't forgotten each, any one of us. We are important to him. And so that's, that's the significance of names. And, and not just his name that's significant, but he puts significance in all the names, enough that he made a, an entire book named names. Amen? Thank you for joining us tonight. We trust you've gotten something out of this message. We'll see you on Sabbath at 11 a.m. Until then, you have a blessed week.